would indicate that the radioactive carbon dioxide had been fixed, reduced, converted to, carbon, to organic carbon in the sample chamber. Now, the results of these two experiments are as I just described. The results of these two experiments are as I just described. The, thank you, Bill. These two experiments gave, by criteria established before launch, positive results. If these two experiments had been landed in Piccadilly Circus and gave these results, you would deduce that there was a low form of life in Piccadilly Circus. <laughs> Higher forms of life would be an open question. But low forms would be very, very likely. Now, that being the case, why don't we hear about uh, lots of life on Mars? There are two reasons. One is that scientists are naturally cautious and uh, think that it's better to uh, make the mistake of saying that they didn't find life, even though later it turns out there's life there, than make the mistake of announcing there's life on Mars and later on find out it's a mistake. It'd be very embarrassing. The other reason is that Mars is not like the Earth, and there's a different kind of inorganic chemistry that can happen on Mars and not on the Earth. For example, um, ultraviolet light from the sun strikes the surface of Mars. That doesn't happen on the Earth because we have ozone here that absorbs the UV. It does not happen on Mars. So the UV, or ultraviolet light, strikes the Martian surface and changes its chemistry. It breaks down water, which is part of the molecular structure of the Martian soil, and oxidizes the environment makes very oxidizing molecules like peroxides and superoxides. Well, if the Martian soil is filled with those guys, those kind of molecules, then it might very well break up radioactive food sent from Earth, release carbon dioxide, which is also radioactive, and fool us into thinking that there's life on Mars that's breathing and, uh, and eating instead of just the chemistry of the soil. So that's a reason why it's most important to be cautious. But the actual situation is that nobody has gone into the laboratory and duplicated these experimental results for Mars. Nobody has, with inorganic chemistry, without life, been able to reproduce, simulate, duplicate these experiments. And until they have, the possibility is very real, in my opinion, that uh, they are due to microbial life on Mars. The alternative explanation is that there's a funny chemistry on Mars which likes to, uh, to do a chemistry which looks like respiration and looks like photosynthesis. If that's the case, that same funny chemistry probably existed in the early history of the Earth because before plants, there was no oxygen, there was no ozone, ultraviolet light struck the surface of our planet. If that's the case, then we can understand much better how the early steps in the uh, chemical history of life, the origin of photosynthesis, the origin of respiration came about. Either way, I believe, these important Viking results have a profound implication for the question of the origin of life and its distribution through the solar system. The trouble is, we don't yet know which of these two different explanations is the right answer. And that is another reason to go back to Mars to look more closely. Now, to say just a few last words about the Viking mission, uh, I'd like to show this rather recent picture. It's just a couple of months uh, old, in which um, we can see all sorts of the parts of the Viking spacecraft in foreground. And in background, we can see a number of rocks. But notice that before many of the rocks, there is a kind of white patch. and. Uh, that white patch is snow. It has been snowing. There has been frost on Mars. It's the winter season, and the frost comes in the nighttime, dissipates in the morning, and we are seeing signs of the weather on Mars. A second point which I'd like to point out to you is this object right here, which looks a little bit like a 35 millimeter slide or a uh, uh, some kind of square thing. It is not a 35 millimeter photograph slide. It is a micro dot. On that little thing is written extremely small the signatures of 10,000 human beings 
who worked on the design, fabrication, testing, launch, mission operations, and scientific analysis for the Viking mission. There are two places on Mars, some thousands of kilometers across, apart, in which 10,000 people have their signatures. And that uh, is, at least in a symbolic sense, an indication that we are becoming a two-planet species. And the last picture I wish to show, it's common to end travelogues with pictures of sunsets. And uh, here is a lovely sunset on Mars taken by the Viking 1 camera. But it is a sunset in a place chosen for its dullness. In fact, we know that it is about the least interesting place on the planet that we can find. We would like to go back to Mars and uh, go to more interesting places. I, myself, would love to go to Mars. And I would love to take some people with me. I would like to take two people with me. Who would like to come <laughs> to Mars? I am delighted that so many people wish to come to Mars. It's very good to come to Mars. Could I ask you to be very careful coming up? And could I ask you, please be careful coming up. And now I'd like you to sit on a Martian rock, if you wouldn't mind. Could you sit on that rock? Good. And could you sit on this rock? Thank you. Whoops, careful. Lightweight Martian rock. And I will sit here. And uh, notice how noisy it is on Mars. We've, uh, we've never sent a microphone to Mars to hear what it's like there. For all we know, it's fabulously interesting. The wind is blowing and all of that. And maybe the rocks are creaky like this. Um, Notice, maybe you noticed in some of the pictures that the sky was not blue on Mars, but pink. Uh, it's true, Mars has a pink sky. And the reason the sky is pink on Mars is because there is always fine reddish dust in the atmosphere. And the reason that the surface material on Mars is red, that the dust in the atmosphere is red, is because Mars is rusty. Now. While we're here on Mars, I think it's important to do a British custom. Uh, it's a uh, program might not be shown at this time, but this time is certainly tea time. And I wonder if we could have some tea on Mars. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I will pour tea, and as I do, I'd like to talk a little bit about what's the next thing to do to study Mars. Because, you see, here we are stuck in one particular place on Mars, and it would be nice to go to other places. To do that, we would have to have a spacecraft which could move about on Mars, which could rove. Would you like some milk in there, or would you have to take a bite? Some milk, yes. And so we have to have a spacecraft with wheels with tractor treads, which could land in the safe and dull places, like here. It's not so dull, because after all, we're having tea. But, uh, <laughs> but it is dull compared to almost everywhere else on Mars. Would you like some more? Uh, let's see. And so that is a technology that we have. We could land space vehicles that go look something like this, but have wheels on them, and go off to the exciting terribly nice places, the enormous volcanoes, the river valleys, the places which are different from the Earth, which are exciting. We can try to look for life in the places which are different from Chrysi and Utopia. We have not yet done that. We may be able to do that soon. Our technology is capable of it. And who knows what further mysteries are to be found on Mars. <laughs>